Hello and great welcome once again. So if you happen to be CFR final level student of corporate financial reporting and if you have opted for 2022 course then this session is for you. I hope you got the message which I intend to actually hammer into your mind. So recently your site, your esteemed site has uploaded some model papers and some of you were requesting me of late actually to come out with some analysis, some sort of analysis. Now, before we start this particular session, let me clear some what we call air of doubt, which some of you are actually nursing. I've seen actually many students are under a sort of phobia, especially after having a look over the uh, question papers of uh, your old course students, because there were quite surprises, many misprints, besides there were, uh, there were quite some complicated questions too. So you need not require to actually um, nurse any such sort of phobia. You need not require to have any sort of scare and fear simply because now the new syllabus is purely in based, in DS based, and there is no question of any complications, no questions of any surprises. It all depends on how well, how deeply, how insightfully actually you have done the course. So that is the only what we call criteria which you need to have to come out with flying colors and of course with flying performance. Second important point is that some of you are asking me, sir. The model papers which have been issued seem quite simple, not exactly simple. Thing is that you have done our courses and we have made the chapter very simple, correct? That is the reason you are feeling so what we call simplicity about these um, questions. And if you have noticed that each and every question is available in our study material, study note and tutorials, correct? So logically, those among you who have subscribed to our courses should not have had any problem in what we call tackling these questions because these are, these are straightforward questions and let me make it absolutely clear as far as new syllabus examination is concerned that, will, that would be absolutely on similar lines as is given in your model papers, correct? There are no chances of surprises, there are no chances of any complexities, there is no chances of any clashings with the existing standard because now existing standards, is standard is no more part of your new syllabus. So new course student will definitely have this sort of benefit but let's start the session this is going to be the first series the first part we are picking up set number one as you can see these papers have been issued by your institute correct final examination model paper set one and you have the solution also along with that that is nice of you and uh, so nice of uh, so nice of the institute in fact because at least they should always give the solution papers to the student anyway so now we come straight to the point and as far as these model papers are concerned, there is section A and in this section A, first of all, you have to go through the lines very carefully. The question states that, <clears throat> uh, answer question number one and eight are compulsory. And secondly, answer any four from question number two, three, four, five, six and seven. So there are lots of choices also given. And that should be the way. To be very honest with you, if the course pattern happens to be pretty par pretty vast, then the student fraternity must be given at least some options, some leeways. And this if the if the paper comes on such line, then I must compliment the institute. Correct? And so far, institute has done very well as far as new syllabus is concerned. I always wish the institute also does the same thing. Correct, just see to it that some printing mistakes are avoided, some lesser complicated questions are filled, and then definitely institute's image will also uh, enhance by leaps and bounds, no doubt about that. So let's come now to the point after these prefacing words. Section A, here it states that choose the correct alternative provided and also provide justification in each case. One mark is allotted for correct selection and one mark for the justification. So all in all, you can say each part of this particular question carries two marks, one for the correct correctness and second for what we call your justification. Now, very first question, if we have gone through, recently I have uploaded a video on NDS 34. If you have gone through that particular video, the very first question which we did, the same question is over here. A company showed a net profit of 720,000 for the third quarter. As you know, NDS 34 deals with interim financial report, correct? So this company, this company has already, see, all each one of you are also having the solution. So please, no one among you should request me for the sheets of these. These are not sheets. These are simply institute's paper. You can simply download it from the site of the institute, correct? And many students I have seen actually, they think actually these are paper sheets. These are not paper sheets. 
I am using actually XP pen set that is 24 inches. These are paneled sheets actually. That is the main reason. Simply because of its vastness. Actually, I can't tell you that how big I am writing here. But still when you watch, you it seems to you so small words. Correct? But let me tell you, this is the best available, what we call digital platform for us to actually for teaching classes. But problem only the thing is that sometimes it becomes very difficult to download this panel sheet. That is the only problem. Anyway, a company showed a net profit of 720,000 for the third quarter. For the third quarter. Correct? So that means this company has already computed the net profit and net profit computed by this particular entity for the third quarter happens to be 720,000. 720,000 is the total profit computed by this particular entity. Further, it is given now, bad debts of rupees 40,000 incurred during the quarter. That means during quarter, third, quarter 3, this company has incurred bad debts of rupees 40,000. We know, as far as when we prepare interim financial reports, this standard is very clear about that, that you are going to use the same principles for income, assets, liabilities, which you use normally for your normal accounts for your annual accounts. Same principles need to be followed. So logically, bad debts have taken place in quarter three, the entire amount of bad debt should have been subtracted, should have been subtracted. But this entity, what it did, instead of subtracting entire, entire what we call amount of 40,000, only 50% of the bad debts have been, uh, have been deferred to the next quarter. Indirectly, it means only 50% have been subtracted and company deferred 15,000 for the next quarter. Out of 40,000, sorry, 20,000 have been subtracted and 20,000, 50% have been deferred for the next quarter. Now, that is the wrong treatment. That means while computing, company has already subtracted 20,000, but company should have had subtracted 40,000. So, that is the reason in order to compute the net profit, you will have to subtract further 20,000 which you haven't or which you have deferred. Correct? Because if you are computing the income for quarter 3, all the expenses related to quarter 3 must be subtracted. This is as simple as that. Further, extraordinary loss of 35,000 incurred during the quarter has been fully recognized in this quarter. Now, this is correct treatment. Is it clear to you or not? This is the correct treatment. Because we have already computed the profit 7,20,000. And question says that this extraordinary loss has been recognized. That means you have already subtracted. So no problem. You, no further treatment is required. Question is simply asking us. Correct quarterly income. Correct, uh, correct quarterly income. So we have corrected it. Now quarterly income will be equal to 7,20,000 minus 7 lakh. I have already forwarded the justification. Justification is bad debts related to quarter 3 should have been subtracted in full. That is the only justification because you have to write in a crisp manner. So you simply write only this much that the bad debts related to quarter 3 should have been subtracted in full. However, company has deferred 50% to the next quarter, which is wrong treatment. So we are going to subtract 20,000 more to find the correct profit. You need not require to write such a long justification. Simply write bad debts should have been subtracted in full. So 7 lakh is your correct answer. And good thing is that there is hardly any misprint. I hope that institute also provides such sort of question in the upcoming examination. Correct. Now in the next question, in next question, it is given that in conglomerate merger of two companies into a new company, the merging companies op operate. Actually, generally in practical life, generally in practical life, Honestly speaking, I wish inside of my heart that this question should not have been part of end AS. Because generally under end AS, we do not talk about such sort of mergers. Correct? Although in AS 14, we used to talk about, but it's still, I'm not telling it is irrelevant question. I'm not telling in any manner. Anyway, so as a student, you need to be aware of all these things. Generally, when we say or we talk about mergers, Generally, mergers take place between companies who are engaged in similar line of trade. Generally, correct? However, in case of conglomerate merger, opposite is the situation. Generally, it takes place between companies whose business activities or functionalities are entirely different. So, in a conglomerate merger of two companies into a new company, the merging companies operate. Now, we have to fill this. 
in related market having similar product line that is wrong that is what exactly i said that in case of normal mergers it happens generally companies actually operate in similar product line but in case of conglomerate mergers generally opposite happens they operate in unrelated markets and generally there is no functional what we call economic relationship so your answer will be second one and i have already given the justification correct now this question this is the only question which was not available however it, it is available in our theoretical notes this question again has been taken correct and this question is also available in our notes also part three details of an asset are as under cost of the asset is given to you as 60 lakhs useful life period given to you is 10 years salvage value is 4 lakhs so 60 lakh minus 4 lakh divided by 10 will give you each year's depreciation further the question says that useful remaining life is 3 years out of total life remaining life is 10 years total time period is 10 years no doubt about that it is given in the question total time period is 10 years correct however it is given that uh, 10 years and only 3 years are remaining upward revision done in last year by 50 percent last year we did try to understand the line of this particular question first of all question says that total life pattern or total life period happens to be 10 years 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 and 10 in order to actually just test our uh, what we call cautiousness question first tells three years are remaining so for a moment we may think that seven years have already gone by now question suddenly says that useful life remaining is three years but upward revision done in last year by 50 percent last year means because a question is telling that three years are remaining indirectly it means we are in the seventh year and indirectly also means that we did some what we call revision last year that mean in the sixth year is it clear to you or not and when we did the revision last year we found that value moved up by 50 percent so whatever our carrying amount was there last year correct so it got up by 50 percent what does it mean it means actually last year whatever was carrying amount i will compute the 50 percent of it and the value will go up by 50 percent current value in use is rupees 12 lakhs and current selling price is rupees 12 lakhs we have gone through in a s impairment so many times correct and current disposal cost is rupees 1 lakh impairment loss to be charged to profit and loss account as per applicable in a s would be so what would be the amount which i am going to charge to profit and loss account as per the applicable standard now in order to compute that you need to have good knowledge of impairment of asset especially in days as i told you first of all i will try to compute what is the carrying amount at the end of the sixth year my first task should be should be to find out the carrying amount why why i want to compute carrying amount at the end of the sixth year or in the beginning of the seventh year because question says that right now we are in the seventh year but question says that last year we did what we call some revaluation so first i will compute the carrying amount at the end of the last year or beginning of the seventh year then i will add 50 percent to it to know what was the actual carrying amount actual book value actual what we call carrying amount of the asset in order to do so what i do i told you in the beginning carrying amount in the beginning of the seventh year or at the end of sixth year are one and same thing correct original cost of the asset is 60 residual value is 4 lakh so net cost is 56 lakh divided by 10 that will give you each year's depreciation and multiply it with 6 that will give you 6 years depreciation so once you have computed the 6 years of depreciation what will be the amount of depreciation of 6 years see your total cost is 60 minus 4 divided by 10 that is 1 year depreciation and you multiply it with 6 that will give you 6 years depreciation then your cost is given as 60 your cost is given as 60 you whatever depreciation you get you subtract it from 60 you will get 26.4 that means at the end of sixth year or in the beginning of seventh year we may say the 
carrying amount of this particular asset had, was 26.40 lakhs. Is it clear to you? Now, on this date, at the end of the sixth year, we did a revaluation and we found that value is 50% more. So we take 50% of this 26.4 into 50% 13.20. As you know, whenever upward revaluation takes place, your entry will be asset account debit to revaluation reserve account. That is 13.20. Indirectly, it means, first of all, you need to understand that after the upward revaluation, what happens now? The carrying amount becomes this. At the end of sixth year or beginning of the at the end of the sixth year or beginning of the seventh year, we may say the carrying amount of this particular asset is 13.39.60. Correct? Is it clear to you? Because we did an upward revaluation. So by adding 13.20, it will become carrying amount in the beginning of uh, in the beginning of the seventh year. Is it clear? Now I will have to compute the depreciation. Because we are in the beginning of the seventh year or end of the sixth year, that is why instead of using the word beginning of seventh year, I want to use the word at the end of the second year. Actually, this amount should have been amount at the end of sixth year. There's still some printing mistake. At the end of sixth year, 39.60. Correct? At the end of the sixth year, now amount has become 39.60. Quite obviously because that your carrying value has changed because of revaluation and as you know the simple rule whenever there is change in carrying value then we revise the depreciation then we compute the revised depreciation you can say so. So new carrying amount is 39.60 so now you consider as the revised cost this will become your revised cost 4 lakh is the residual value. And remaining period of life is four years, not three years, because we are at the end of the sixth year. So I will divide it by four. So this will become per year depreciation. So per year depreciation will be equal to 8.90. So that means sixth year's depreciation in the uh, sorry, seventh year depreciation will be equal to 8.90. We have already computed the carrying amount at the end of this, at the end of the what we call sixth year. Now we will compute the depreciation amount and depreciation account is 8.90. So now we may say that whatever we are getting, this is your value of the asset at the end of the seventh year or in the beginning of the eighth year. Is it clear to you? First of all, what we did. We simply found out the value of the asset at the end of the sixth year. You think in this manner, correct? At the end of the seventh year, the value is 26.40. We did the upward revaluation. We found the asset value has gone up by 13.20. So new carrying amount at the end of sixth year will be 39.60. And then we compute a depreciation. We charge the depreciation. Is it clear to you or not? Now, this is the carrying amount at the end of the sixth year. Now, we will reach the what we call seventh year end then I will write the depreciation 8.90. So I may say that this carrying amount, which I am having now, this is at the end of the seventh year or beginning of the eighth year, you can say so. So 39.70 will become your carrying amount. But you must not forget that in this carrying amount, included is revaluation reserve of 13.20. Why I am saying so? Now, when we reach the beginning of the eighth year, correct? It is given in the question, see beginning of the eighth year, it is given in the question that current your selling price and value in use was given in the question. The question says that current value in use is 12 lakh. As you know, we try to find out recoverable amount and recoverable amount is value in use and value in use is equal to current value you current value in use is equal to 12 lakh and current selling price, current selling price, that is net selling price, I will compute 11 lakh and disposal cost is 1 lakh. What will be the recoverable amount out of these two, lower figure or higher figure? We have actually seen that under India's on impairment, correct? So, 
after having a look over this particular item, now I will try to find out recoverable amount. In order to find out your recoverable amount, you will have to take the higher value between the value in use and net selling price. The higher value we have just seen is equal to 12 lakh. Correct? So now, recoverable value is 12 lakh, whereas carrying value is 30.70. What is this? So this is a case of impairment loss. So impairment loss has taken place to the extent of 18.70. Correct? 18.70 is your impairment loss. Now question is asking what portion, what portion, see actually first of all you need to understand what is impairment loss. Impairment loss, impairment loss basically is the difference between the carrying amount and the recoverable amount. And recoverable amount happens to be higher of value in use or net selling price. So we know that value in use is 12 lakh and net selling price was 10 lakh. So higher value we picked up and carrying amount is 39, 30.70, something like carrying amount in the beginning is 30.70. So that mean now impairment has taken place to the extent of difference of these two, that is 18.70. Now what is the main demand of the question? Logically and most of the time impairment losses are always debited to profit or loss account. Normally, Whatever impairment loss takes place, we debit it to profit and loss account. But at the same time, if there is some existing balance in the revaluation reserve, then standard says that impairment loss must be adjusted against that revaluation reserve. Because we have seen that we are already having, an, having a balance of 13.20 in the revaluation reserve. So whatever impairment loss has taken place, that is 18.70, out of that 13.20, 2.0 will be debited to revaluation reserve and the difference between these two will be equal to 5.50 and that will be debited to your profit and loss account. Is it clear to you or not? So that is how you are going to do this question. This question in same form, the same wordings, with same figures is available in our study note. This is a theoretical question and this question has been taken from government accounting. Which of the following is not a feature of government accounting? For that, you need to understand, first of all, what are the features of government accounting? The features of government accounting are actually reporting of utilization of funds. There are many what we call features, but prominent among them is reporting of utilization of funds, double entry system. As we know, government accounting system is based upon double entry system. And most significant characteristic of government accounting is that it is fund based accounting because whenever government has to allocate resources to a particular project, we always create a fund. And from that particular fund, the various what we call resources are utilized. And here in option, you are given non-fund based uh, accounting. So it will not be considered as a feature of government accounting. However, rest of the rest of the options are features of government accounting. This question has been taken and I should not say has been taken. It is also available in our study notes. You must have seen actually correct. Recently, I have done India ascended in three lots of lectures I uploaded on YouTube. So, if you have seen, you must have seen that in our section number one, in our section one, which dealt with what we call computation of goodwill, NCI, etc. So, over there, this question was available. C Limited acquired 60% interest in G Limited on 1st of January 2021. Now, C Limited paid 700 lakhs in cash for their interest. So, first thing is that you need to find out how much actually you have paid to acquire 60 in order to get the control actually you paid 700 lakhs and the payment was done in cash further it is given in the question the fair value of g limited's acquiries assets is 1800 lakhs and fair value of its liability is equal to 900 lakhs very simple so many times we have done such sort of question i need not require to explain it to be very honest with you every time to explain everything will consume only time but anyway it's still First of all, we always take into account the net identifiable asset of acquiry company on the date of acquisition. So on the date of acquisition, net, net identifiable asset of acquiry company. Now it is clearly mentioned that fair value of acquiry company G, G Limited's asset is equal to 1,800 lakhs and liability is equal to 900 lakhs. So we may say that fair value is equal to 900 lakhs. 
that mean on the date of acquisition total net assets of acquiry company were 900 lakhs after having found the net assets on the date of acquisition we try to find it out what is the share of nci and what is the share of parent or acquirer correct because 60 percent control is in our hand so 40 percent must be in the hands of the nci so you will compute 40 percent of 900 that will tell you the that will tell you the proportionate net asset which belong to NCI on the date of acquisition. And likewise, if I am going to compute 60% of 900, if I am going to compute 900 into 60%, that will give me 540. That means parents' share in the net assets on the date of acquisition is equal to 540. After having computed this, now we are in a position to find out what we call goodwill or non-controlling interest but here the question is simply asking us compute the non-controlling interest so non-controlling interest will be equal to 40 percent of 900 you can find it out easily that is equal to 360 question is asking only this much what is the share of nci however this share which you have computed you must also mention in the examination on psna basis because as we know that non-controlling interest can be what we call valued on fair value basis and can be valued on proportionate share of net assets basis. This time we have valued NCI on proportionate share of net asset basis because out of net assets we have simply taken their 40% value. So 360 lakh will be your correct option and answer is already given. I have also explained it. Further here it is given Utkars Limited declares the following information. This question relates to IND AS21. Actually this bottle paper is guiding you that which are the IND AS where you have to stress upon a lot. Correct? And But you will be asked very simple question. But those among you who have subscribed to our courses must have seen that we have covered each IND AS at tremendous amount of length and lots of case studies have been also inserted over there. So Utkars Limited declares the following information. What is the information that you purchased goods worth dollar one lakh? Purchase goods on 12 0 3 2022 of USD one lakhs, and then exchange rate it is given to you as at 31st of 3 2022 is this much, correct? And then date of actual payment is actually this much, date of actual payment. So in this question, what you will have to do? I purchased goods to the extent of 1 lakh and I purchased at this particular rate. Correct? USD per rupee is equal to this much. So I purchased it for 78 point on the date of purchase it is 78.60 of course when i will purchase the goods what will be my entry my entry will be purchases account debit to foreign creditors account because i am purchasing these goods from outside india correct so that will be my entry with this particular amount this entry will be done when you purchase the goods that is on 12 0 3 2022 then when you will reach the reporting date 31st of 3 2022 31st 3 2022 what will be your entry the entry is that because of change in exchange rate now exchange rate has moved up because exchange rate has moved up and creditors creditors generally most of the item of the balance sheet are of monetary nature correct there are hardly few items which are of non-monetary nature, otherwise 99% items are of monetary nature. Now try to understand my point. The standard simply says that when we will reach the end of the reporting date, then I will record the monetary item for monetary item foreign creditors as per the rate prevailing on the reporting date. Now because earlier I have recorded the creditors at 1 lakh into 78.60, when I will reach the end of the reporting period, I will record it at 1 lakh dollar 1 lakh into now the rate is equal to 79 obviously there will be some loss and loss will be equal to what will be the loss 1 lakh into you will take the difference of these two 78.60 and 79 i think it is equal to point, uh, point 0.40 whatever it is 
this this loss you are going to recognize and your entry will be profit a loss account debit because this is a loss and your liability will increase so your entry will be like this profit a loss account debit to foreign creditors account however question is not asking this question is asking what will be the gain or loss to be booked in the financial year 2021-22 okay question is simply asking us what will be the gain or loss which we have to actually record in 2021-22 now actually in this case i have already computed this so your answer will be this much because question is asking only what will be our loss or gain for the year actually what point i just wanted to because our accounting year will end on 31st or 3, 2022. So for 21, 22, my loss will be this much and this will be my answer. Actually, there could have been one more question. Because actual payment is being done on 12-4, 12 2022 Actual payment is being done on 12 2022 when I will make the actual payment, again I will incur a loss. Are you getting my point or not? I will incur a loss to the extent, again I will incur a loss in the sense means, because right now my creditors in the books are being reflected at what value? See, originally when I purchased, my creditors were reflected in the books at 1 lakh into 78.60. But creditors value increased by the end of the year by 0 0.40 so that means on the reporting date creditors are being reflected in the books at 1 lakh dollar into 79 correct but when i will make the payment on this date to these creditors i will have to make a payment of 1 lakh into 79.50 79.50 that means there will be another loss when I am going to make the payment. And that loss will be recognized in the year 20, because now our 1-4-2021, and we are making the payment on 12-04-2022. So it will be from 1-4-2022 till 31-3-2023. That means they could have had asked another question. One question they have already asked, what will be the loss which we are going to book in the financial year 21-22? That will be your answer. Correct? What would what would be the loss for the year 22-23? That would have been the difference of these two. If they would have had asked. Correct? Next question is, which of the following is or are financial assets? This is related to India's 109. This is related to India's 109, you can say India's 107 or India's 32, because all these three standard deals with financial instruments. However, in your new course, and even in old course, there is hardly one or two pages. So, nothing more will be asked, but in new course, you may be asked some questions, correct? So, in new course, they have asked this particular question as far as objective sort of question is concerned, which of the following is our financial asset? Very well, we have explained the meaning of financial assets, financial liability, and what we call uh, equity. These three items play a very important role, these three terms, in fact, to understand the, what we call concept of financial instrument. Correct? Now, if you have gone through our lectures, over there also we have explained, and everyone knows that as per India's financial assets are, as per the option, cash is considered as financial asset. Correct? equity instrument of another entity because if i have purchased the equity instrument of another entity in that particular case i have the right and other entities under an obligation correct so an equity instrument and a contractual right contractual right means suppose suppose i have sold you goods on credit so I have the contract, there is a contract now between you and I that I have to take money from you and you are under, obligated to pay me back. So which of the following is our financial asset? So in this particular case, it seems all are, all are financial assets because they all fall under the what we call category of financial asset. Is it clear to you? For example, when we buy equity share of a particular company, that means I am making the investment. I am making the investment, an equity instrument of another entity, correct? 
so that means another we have given money to the another entity we can take that particular money we can sell it off also so that is what we call financial asset cash is always considered as financial asset contractual right con just i gave a, gave an example of contractual right when i sold the goods on credit so moreover these definitions are very simple and given to you in your lectures also which we have supplied to you now we come over to the next point which of the following which of the following criteria is not used in the contest of esg correct you have already gone through the, your what we call syllabus now one page one or two pages notes have been supplied by your institute in your module correct but my book was released much earlier than that correct from commercial law house so as you know i have a book published for the new course now cfr if some of you are interested in buying those books you can buy it from a commercial law house on the site of commercial law house or make my trip or amazon it is available everywhere now under esc which of the following criteria is in the contest of esc of course esc e stands for environmental s for social and of course g for governance level so in this particular case esc lastly used criteria used are environmental social and governance test criteria so in this case which of the following criteria is not used so your answer will be competitive test criteria in this particular case the ninth one actually as per indus 103 accounting and reporting for business transaction is done under it is very simple most simple method we have seen that as per indus 103 accounting is done as per India's acquisition, now some of you might say, sir, we also use pooling interest method. Pooling interest method is not given as part of India's. It is part of appendix which is attached to what we call India's. There is a difference between these two things which you need to understand. It's correct. So acquisition method is correct. And then as far as 10th question is concerned, it says that net profits of J Limited for the year 2021, 2021, 1920, 18, 19, 2017, 18, 2016, 70 are 25 crores, 20 crores, 15 crores, 10 crores and 5 crores. Lots of profits have been given. During 2020-21, company incurred 7 lakh and rupees 3 lakh on free education and medical treatment of the employees of the company and their families respectively under the CSR project. First of all, why they have given lots of profits? Why they have given these lots of profit? Last almost previous five years profits are given given to you in the question. Correct? Because your most current year is 2020-21, wherein you earned a profit of 25 crores. Previous to that is 1920. 1920 and profits of this year will be equal to 20 crores and then 1890 that means from the current year onwards most recent years i will take first and previous three year figure i will consider correct that is equal to 25 20 and 15. now i will add it and compute their average profit which i think i have already done Yes, I have done here. So I'm escaped of doing 20 plus 15 plus 3. So my average profit is equal to 15 crore. If you have gone through chapter on corporate social reporting, correct? CSR, as you know, companies like 2013 have. 13 has almost made it mandatory upon companies to spend some portion of their profits on what we call welfare activity, in fact, known as corporate social welfare activities. So so 15 is 15 crore is my average profit of previous three years so minimum csr expenditure will be what percentage i think this sort of question we did under past paper analysis series also i distinctly remember correct so 15 crores is my average profit and rule is that a company must spend two percent of it so that two percent comes to 30 lakh rupees but out of that 30 lakhs we have spent so far only only 
सेवन लैक ऑन फ्री एजुकेशन एंड थ्री लैक ऑन मेडिकल ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ द इंप्लॉइज ऑनेस्टली स्पीकिंग सेवन लैक विच यू हैव स्पेंट ऑन फ्री एजुकेशन दिस एक्टिविटी फॉल्स विद इन दी वट वी कॉल विसिनिटी ऑफ एक्टिविटीज नोटिफाइड बाई दी सी एस आर कमिटीज और सी एस आर एक्ट करेक्ट वेन यू स्पेंड थ्री लैक ऑन मेडिकल ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ द इंप्लॉय दिस एक्टिविटी इज नॉट कंसिडर्ड एज पार्ट ऑफ सी एस आर प्रोजेक्ट सो इन दिस केस वी विल कंसिडर एज इफ वी वर सपोज टू स्पेंड थर्टी लैक दैट इज टू परसेंट अवर टू परसेंट ऑफ अवर एवरेज प्रॉफिट दैट कम्स टू थर्टी लैक दैट मीन लॉजिकली द कंपनी शुड हैव हैड स्पेंड थर्टी लैक्स ऑन सी एस आर एक्टिविटीज बट कंपनी हैज स्पेंड ओनली सेवन लैक ऑन सी एस आर एक्टिविटीज correct in my notes i have given which are the activities which fall under what we call csr activity so that is the reason logically your 23 lakh should be the correct answer correct so now we take up section b now before we take up section b because we have to take care of the time factor also because time factor is very very important and that is the only problem which we face otherwise you do one thing when next time you come into the class correct you come prepared with as 23 correct i have so i have already solved this question don't worry about that you can see the solution and even second part solution theoretical note and then you also pay attention to your end as 103 actually this question i have recently covered end as 103 deferred consideration concept correct and this question is of reverse equation is straight forward available in my notes also correct reverse equation i would like you to go through all these terms so that next time when i solve it you should not have any problem in understanding the same this question is a reverse equation and in fact reverse equation a video is i have already uploaded you can watch it simply type reverse equation by sanjay wilkins you can see the video same question i have solved over there in fact i have solved two questions and one question is this one and besides that what should i say about this question is in the as 17 i need not require to talk about this particular fact so many times we have done these questions correct even this question is also available in our notes now this question actually relates to in the as 12 in the as 12 so whatever standards i am writing over here tomorrow when you join the class it is better to have a look over these standards so that you understand this section pretty well correct and then this is a solution i have given this question is related to valuation of goodwill this question is also available in our notes same question same figures i have i have solved all question in fact solutions are also available institute has given the solution this question has been taken from consolidated account correct this question is also available in our notes and i have done it in the class also and then seventh question are theoretical questions section c in section c we have been given a question which is related to valuation of shares this question is related to valuation of shares honestly speaking so far even i couldn't get time so these are the questions so tomorrow i will solve the remaining remain all the remaining questions correct because of time paucity i am stopping myself i have already told you now as per my watch it is now 21 past 7 so this video should be uploaded by 8 8:30 as i promised so it will take a bit of time so i am stopping myself till up to section 1 but i think in the next session itself we'll finish up the remaining section of this particular topic shall meet you then tomorrow but whatever i have talked about especially with respect to india's 12 india's 
and India is 103. Correct? You come prepared with all these things so that you get a good mileage of these sessions. So, okay, shall meet you in the next session.